Hello and welcome to the next episode of Designing Flying Wings. I'm Raul Klingberg, your host. So as you can see from the uh, picture, I'm not in my normal shop space. I'm actually in my uh, hotel room and I'm currently on travel doing some consulting work. Uh, you may know of me from my Klingberg Wing and Klingberg Wing Mark II. This is a new series of videos that I'm doing on how to design a flying wing and actually looking for some ideas on what I should do as my next project. Uh, as questions and comments have come in. Uh, I've happened to run into one that I see on a regular basis. Uh, I received it from the last video that I did in this series, and I've received it in the past. And that has to do with uh, what would be called uh, Yonkers flaps. Um, I'll put up a picture here uh, showing the original German design from the 1920s. It is a flap or an aileron surface that is mounted below and aft of the trailing edge of the wing. And people often say, well, the Mitchell wing used them, why don't you use them on your wing? And it's a valid question, uh, and it leads us down to some very interesting uh, engineering discussions, which of course is what this series is about. Uh, so I thought it'd be an interesting one to tackle. Okay, so uh, I'll put up a picture here uh, of the Mitchell wing showing the same type of uh, flap arrangement. And those flaps were used as elevons or both elevator and aileron function. I think originally uh, Mitchell intended them to be just ailerons and weight shift for pitch control, but I think eventually it was set up so that uh, uh, they served both functions. I know certainly on the powered versions that's true. The Mitchell wing used them for a variety of reasons which were appropriate for the Mitchell wing, but not necessarily for other designs. And that is for one simple engineering fact. Every aircraft is designed for a different set of requirements. Usually when you start a new aircraft design, it isn't to do just one thing. You have a series of things that you want to do with that aircraft, and then you have to design the aircraft to meet those requirements. Uh, in the professional engineering world, we use a thing called a requirements tree. At the, at the top level of the tree, there's a few requirements, three, four, five of them, and all the other requirements flow out of that, and some of them are interrelated. Uh, in the defense industry, requirement trees are often dealt with with very large relational databases, and there's a whole engineering profession that deals with tracking those requirements and balancing the requirements. That would be called systems engineering. Uh, people spend their whole careers just tracking requirements and trying to get them to all balance out. Uh, you can't let just the propulsion group run the design. You can't let the aero group run the design or structures or anything else. You have to take all of the requirements and balance them together. And these requirement trees can be huge, um, thousands and thousands of requirements, and they all have to be worked out and be compatible with each other. Designing aircraft is not a simple thing and requires high level of training, and there's a lot of complexity. You'd spend a lifetime and still have a lot to learn. I know I have. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll see if I can find a picture of a requirements tree, a, a graph of one, and I'll put that up, and, and you can see just get an inkling of the uh, complexity of those requirements. So the Mitchell wing had some pretty straightforward requirements. Uh, number one was to have really high performance. Now, that is a relative term uh, given hang gliders at the time. When the Mitchell wing was designed, hang gliders had five to one, six to one. Maybe if you're lucky, you got seven to one glide ratio. Well, that's nothing. Uh, so high performance was a relative term. If you got 10 or 12 to one L over D, you were doing great. You were doubling the performance of your average hang glider at the time. Um, so to do that was not a huge leap forward. And... There were other requirements that drove that design, such as uh, Mitchell wanted people to be able to build it at home, wanted to be able to produce kits or produce them simply with a uh, minimal number of tools. Well, that drives you into a wood structure, especially when you throw in the fact that you want it to be lightweight enough to pick it up and run with it. Oh, and it's got to be affordable. There's another requirement. So affordability, lightweight, easy to work with at home. Wood is an obvious solution been used in aircraft for, well, since the very beginning, right? The Wright brothers built theirs out of wood. So wood's a great answer, and that's what Mitchell chose. Uh, so once you have wood selected as your material, 
there are certain uh, directions that you get driven in in terms of the design. Now, um, my guess is, having never met the man or talked to anybody that knows the details of that design, he wanted to keep it simple so that it was easy to build at home. Um, and he knew his aircraft was going to fly slow, 30, 35 miles an hour. And he knew that he was going to have to have elements that were highly effective at low speeds and be easy to build for the home builder. So he tosses this around in his mind and probably thought of this, that, and the other thing. Probably looked at spoilers, um, which, by the way, are a bad answer for turning a flying wing. Um, and he ended up at the Yonkers flaps because they give great control effectiveness at relatively low speeds. And what most people don't realize when they first look at them, pretty darn easy to build. You can just uh, provide a, a series of brackets right on the trailing edge of the wing. You can attach them to the ribs, have them right at the trailing edge of the wing, and you can bolt your Yonkers flap on there. And when you bolt it on, that's the hinge point also. It's really simple. Whereas if you have to cut an aileron out of a wing surface, like I did with my current design, that's a lot of work. Uh, you either have to build it separate or cut it out of the wing structure, and then you have to put in a control surface spar, in fact, two of them. You have to put one on the Elevon side, and you have to put one on the wing side, and those spars have to be mated to each other, and they might have to cross through some other interesting <laughs> structural considerations within the wing. So it becomes quite complex quickly unless you're very careful about the design. Now, with my design, I got around some of the complexity by using molded composite parts. Uh, that can help prevent some of the problems of having to build everything by hand. On some of the uh, Elevon spars, I did build them by hand, and it was a lot of handwork and certainly much more complex than just bolting onto the trailing edge. And it's not that I didn't think about bolting onto the trailing edge. My first one, I'll put up a picture here, the elevons are simply bolted right to the trailing edge of the ribs with bolts that also serve as the hinge pins so I could remove the elevons for transportation. And uh, they're essentially Yonkers flaps, but they're not separated down and below the wing. Um, so there's way more than aerodynamics that comes into choosing what type of control configuration you're going to have. But that said, let's talk a little bit about the aerodynamics that work and what makes the Yonkers flaps so effective. So let's see, I hope you can see the whiteboard. I tried to arrange it so that my uh, studio light ring here doesn't reflect off of it too much, but <laughs> you probably see it oh, down in the corner over here. So we'll just try to keep that to a minimum. Um, so we have your basic airfoil here. Uh, I'm showing the airflow going over the airfoil. This is the front stagnation point where the velocity is zero by definition. And back here near the trailing edge, the velocity goes back to zero or close to it. And we got our Yonkers flap down here. And you see it's hinged. They're usually hinged at about one-third a cord, quarter cord. You could actually hinge them anywhere you want. Uh, hinging them in the forward half of that airfoil shape uh, helps prevent flutter. And uh, they are usually symmetrical in configuration. They don't have to be, but they usually are so that they have the same lift curve slope, whether they're deflected up or down. And I'm showing here the, the free stream going through below the, below the wing and in between the wing and the elevon shape here. Now, as we know from Bernoulli's principle, anytime we force the air to go up over a curve like this, the velocity increases. And it's that increase in velocity that causes the drop in pressure, which generates lift. Well, the same thing happens back here because we've created essentially venturi. We've put a curved surface below what could be a flat or a curved surface, but we've created a venturi, and the velocity will increase in this region. And this increase in velocity will cause the elevon or aileron or flap, whatever you want it to be, to be extra effective. And this is how slotted flaps work. Uh, if you fly on airliners on a regular basis, you see the flaps go down, and they actually have a slot in between that allows the air to pass between the wing and the flap surface, and that greatly increases their effectiveness. And I'm sure Mitchell, being an aeronautical engineer, was well aware of this fact, 
And he knew that if he did Yonkers flaps on his Mitchell wing, even if he was flying really slow, they'd be very effective. And, and indeed, they were. Um, but there's a price that you pay on all of that. And all of this aero engineering stuff is nothing but a big trade-off. Everything is a trade. You want something, you can get it by doing particular things, but you might pay a price somewhere else. And the price that you pay here with the Yonkers flap is high drag. And because as you increase the velocity going through here, the drag goes up. It's essentially as though you're generating lift. Generate lift, you generate more drag. Same thing happens here. Same thing happens with the Venturi. As we get this necking down and the speed increases as it goes through here, there's drag that's generated. And it's more than just the skin friction against the walls of the Venturi. Uh, you actually get drag that's associated with that increase in velocity. So um, you get the extra effectiveness because of the increase in velocity, but you pay the price of drag. And Mitchell probably felt that that was okay because he's going to be flying 30, 35 miles an hour, 40 tops, um, which is relatively slow. Um, and the amount of drag increase because of this, minimal at best. So it's a trade-off. Great control effectiveness, a little bit more drag. You can live with that, so especially when you wanted to have superior performance over a glider that has a 5 to 1 glide ratio and you have 10 or 12, you can sacrifice a little bit of drag to get control effectiveness. Once again, it's a trade-off. It's a balancing of requirements. Now, why don't I have them on my way? Well, shoot, I want to go 100 miles an hour. The drag goes as the square of the velocity. And there's quite a difference between going 30 miles an hour and going 100. It's a factor of three squared. So it's like nine times the amount of drag. That's a lot. Um, so the Yonkers flaps are not a wise choice for a high-speed sailplane, which is essentially what my current flying wing is, the Mark II. Now, future design? Well, people have written in and says, well, how about a floater? You know, I'd like to just go out on the weekends and float around and have fun, but I want to have better performance. I want a floater, but with high performance. That's an interesting trade. We'll talk about that later in a later video. But anyway, um, so floater, maybe, you know, you might want to go back to a Yonkers flap. If you're flying slow, you don't have to worry about that extra drag. But there's another problem with those darn Yonker flaps. Let me take another sip of my soda here. For flying wings, this is quite a problem. When you deflect your Yonkers flap down like this over here, and you close up that space there between the wing and the flap, and you get this big jump in velocity, and it becomes very effective. Lots of drag. Big bump in velocity, big bump in drag, and you get a lot of adverse yaw. And if you follow with flying wings, you study them at all, adverse yaw, big issue. Um, we try to keep our winglets as small as possible. Uh, yaw stability, yaw control are always uh, an edgy topic on flying wings. And the less adverse yaw you have, the better. Um, so Yonkers flap is notorious for adverse yaw. Why wasn't it a problem on the Mitchell wing? Once again, it's flying slow. That added drag wasn't that huge of a deal. But if you look into the history of it, you'll find that the original Mitchell wing didn't have any winglets on it. It was a pure flying wing. Uh, I'll look around and see if I can find a little copy of it here flying in the 70s uh, and, and run that over the top of something here. And you can see it had no winglets. Uh, but as they quickly discovered, the adverse yaw was a bit of a problem. There wasn't enough yaw stability. So later, Mitchell wings all ended up with winglets of one kind or another. And it's probably an outgrowth of both its uh, relatively shallow sweep angle of the wing and those yonker flaps when you deflect them they really cause a lot of adverse yaw so pluses and minuses balancing off adverse yaw add the winglets add the winglets more drag um yonkers flaps more drag but we're flying slow so not that big of a problem very effective control surfaces oh bingo we like that i'd rather sacrifice some performance a little bit of drag for effective control surfaces. Uh, unfortunately, at the speeds that I'm flying my wing, uh, not a good trade-off. Now, you, you might be stopping to think, 
well, why the heck did Yonkers ever put them on their plane? Well, shoot, take a look at the picture of the plane. There's three big radial engines on there. What's a little bit more drag? You just squeak that throttle forward, and who cares? Uh, you burn up a little bit more fuel. Not that big of a deal. On a sailplane, where drag, especially a flying wing where drag is everything, you really don't want to buy into any drag that you don't have to buy into. So keeping low drag is really critical. Uh, so overall, if you want to fly a little bit faster than 30 miles an hour and you don't want to have giant winglets to overcome the adverse yaw, Yonkers flaps end up in the circular file uh, just very quickly. They, they just get thrown out of the trade pool and, and there you go, you're, you're done. You just have to accept the fact that you're going to have some other type of control surface. And as you go into higher speeds, more conventional uh, control surfaces really work out best, although they are harder to build. Now, um, my original wing that I showed you earlier and the Millennium uh, had essentially a Yonkers flat, but just bolted right onto the trailing edge of the wing. Uh, so it was acting like a normal flapped control surface um, and did not have the added benefit of having the slot there uh, to make them more effective. Well, I'll tell you, my Elevons on my original wing are almost identical in size to the ones on the Mitchell wing, and they're pretty close in size to the Millennium. Uh, they are all effective. The, all of those aircraft were controllable, and they use about the same size control surface. And the Millennium and my first wing didn't have the slot. They were not Yonkers flaps, yet they provided sufficient control authority. So at this point, I would have to question whether Mitchell really needed that slotted space there, whether or not he could have just taken the same type of control surface, bolted it onto the trailing edge, and he'd been fine. Uh, I don't know. It'd be an interesting experiment to run sometime if somebody had a, uh, a Mitchell wing sitting around that they're willing to hack up, you know, just uh, take those control surfaces and mount them right up to the trailing edge of the wing and see what the difference might be. It would certainly be lower drag and the adverse yaw would not be as bad. And it'd be interesting to see if they were effective enough. Now, as we've talked through this, uh, a couple of the thoughts have come to mind uh, that I want to introduce here in terms of everything is a trade-off. Everything's a trade-off. So when aircraft designers do these designs, we're not just looking at, oh, here's something that solves my aerodynamic problem and I'm, it's going to be sweet. Everything will be just fine. No, we're looking at piles and piles of requirements. And sometimes there are requirements that are hidden uh, according to the general public. You know, the general public does not see those requirements immediately. And one of those requirements could be durability. Uh, can you transport this thing around? Can you put it together, take it apart? Can you handle the aircraft without damaging it? Now, if your Elevon is attached right to your trailing edge, Oh, well, that, that can be okay. Now, for both the Millennium and my first wing, those were unbolted for transportation, so the wing could fold up and we could transport it. But on the Mitchell wing, they stay bolted on. Now, when you have a Yonkers flap, they're extended aft and below the wing. Well, you have to have brackets there to do that. You have to have some type of brackets that's attached to the rib to transfer the loads from the flap up into the wing. And because it is separated from the wing, that means that if it gets bumped into, it can move. In other words, that structure is not as rigid. Which mean, And if it's not as rigid, it means it's probably more susceptible to damage. So you're, you're ground handling this thing, and you have to fold up the control surface or fold the wing or whatever, and you got these brackets that are sticking down below the wing. Are they aluminum? Are they wood? Are they composite? What are they? Uh, the designer has to design those brackets to take the loads of getting accidentally bumped into, you know, somebody's maneuvering around, somebody bumps into somebody else and they bump into the wing, and the next thing you hear is crunch, and then you have a big repair problem on your hands. You gotta take the covering off, you gotta repair the ribs, and oh, that's right. By the way, if you're attaching it right to the trailing edge of the ribs, now you gotta beef up the ribs uh, in order to take those accident, accidental loads, which we, all lump into a category called ground handling factors. So their ground handling factors are loads, which must be taken into consideration. And for these ultralight aircraft that we're working with, sometimes ground handling loads can exceed aerodynamic loads by a factor of 10 or more. Uh, 
sometimes we're driven to a particular design strictly because of ground handling, not because of any other aerodynamic loads. But the general public or somebody who doesn't do this for a living wouldn't see that at first. Uh, only when you actually delve right into this stuff and begin designing an aircraft, uh, you either do it wrong and have problems, or you stop and you consider all of these factors while you're doing your design. You do all of the trade studies. You list out all of the requirements of the design, and you do your trade studies before you forge ahead and start designing and building stuff. The first step in the designing process is to look at the requirements and balance them out. So there's, as you've seen now, there's a variety of reasons to not have Yonkers flaps on a hang glider. There's one good reason for it, and that's they're highly effective at low speeds. But there's a whole bunch of drawbacks to it, and it all matters. It's it just a matter of how you balance it out. It is also simpler to build. I give you that. Uh, my current Elevons on my Klingberg Wing Mark II, quite a complex build uh, and, and quite involved. I wouldn't recommend it for the average home builder. Somebody has to have some skill to be able to do it. Uh, the other designs are much easier to build. So um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to talk about here is the stall angle of the uh, Yonkers flap. Some people might say that they're more effective because you can deflect them to a higher angle of attack and get more lift out of them than you will from a conventional flapped wing. Uh, unfortunately, that would be untrue. Uh, mostly uh, symmetrical airfoils are used for Yonkers flaps. And whether you're going down or up with it, your maximum angle of attack on that thing is limited by the stall angle of attack for the wing section that was chosen for the flap surface. And most of them are symmetrical. And I'll put up some curves here, somewhere over here, over the top of this, that will show you the stall angle of attack for different cambered airfoils. And you'll see that the symmetrical airfoil has the lowest stall angle of attack out of about all airfoils. Um, and for most airfoils, most standard cambered airfoils, your stall angle of attack is going to be somewhere between, oh, 13 and 17 degrees. Uh, for a symmetrical airfoil, it's only about 10 degrees, 10 or 11 degrees. So significantly lower stall angle of attack. And these control surfaces, the Yonker flaps, are only going to be fully effective up until their stall angle of attack. Uh, so you re really can only deflect them maybe 12, 13 degrees before they start to uh, well, they'll plateau off. They'll still be effective, but you won't get more control effectiveness by deflecting them more. You'll just get a lot of separated flow and drag and adverse yaw. Um, and strangely enough, for a standard flapped airfoil, if I can get over here, if you can see this, usually the flapped portion, the control surface portion, is eh, it's 20% accord, 25% accord, somewhere around in there. And that's a little bit more cord than you would get with the Yonkers flap, but there's no slot here. There could be, but generally there isn't. Just make it easier to build. And uh, they lose effectiveness right around 15, 17 degrees. It's almost as if you could ignore all of the forward portion of the airfoil and say, this is a symmetrical section of the wing, essentially, and it's going to be good up to maybe 15 degrees before you start getting a bunch of separated flow back here. What you'll get is... Uh, like the start of a stall. You'll begin to get some turbulent flow come off of here, and the more you deflect it, the more the flow separates as you go up, and pretty soon the whole thing is stalled and it's not effective anymore. And on my wing, we found that's right around 17 degrees is where that happens. And this is a problem of uh, what has to do with flow momentum and Reynolds number and boundary layer and trying to keep the boundary layer attached. Because on any airfoil, the flow starts out at zero up front. Wing hasn't gotten there yet. Flows, there's no flow. It's not moving over the wing. And by the time you get to the trailing edge, you have to get back to zero. Aerodynamic law kind of dictates that. It, it will never be exactly zero, but you get close to zero. So as you come back along the wing, the velocity on the wing is tending towards zero. And by the time you get back to a flap surface like this, it's getting pretty darn close to zero. There's not a lot of momentum in this flow to carry it around the corner or up the hill if it's deflected up. And it likes to separate, especially on low speed, low Reynolds number uh, aircraft. High speed aircraft, generally, you're only deflecting the control surfaces 
one degree, three degrees, maybe five at the most. That'd be a lot of deflection, unless you're some type of aerobatic aircraft, uh, an extra 300 or something like that. Uh, it's a totally different animal. But for most normal speed aircraft, the other round deflections are pretty small. Um, for gliders, we get much larger deflections. We try to keep the flow attached at higher levels of deflected control surface. Modern sailplanes often put a trip strip right in front of the control surface through a little zigzag piece of plastic along the wing, like this out along the wing. And that trips the flow, adds some energy to it, and helps it stay attached to the airfoil uh, and increases control effectiveness at the expense of a little bit more drag. If it's done right, it's not too much more drag, especially if you eliminate the separated flow back here. Uh, and on some modern sailplanes, that actually works out to be a pretty good trade-off uh, to trip the flow. Now, we tried it on my wing. Um, you know, modern sailplanes up flying around 50, 55 miles an hour. I, I have a stall speed of 23 miles an hour, half of that. So trip strips didn't work. Turbulators would work, but they're huge and they generate a lot of drag. So um, not really an answer. So if you've been watching my series on developing my Mark II wing, and if you look at some of the work that was done on the Prannel wing, especially relative to the control surface planform shapes, that's the shape as you look at it from above, straight down at it, moving the hinge line forward by putting a reverse taper on the elevon. In other words, the elevon skinny towards the root of the wing and thicker out towards the tip. That's reverse of what most control surfaces are. Actually does several good things for you. Number one, it helps prevent spins. And I'll put a link in the description about my series on preventing spins on flying wings and why that reverse taper is a big plus. And it also helps prevent spanwise flow, which is a good thing because that keeps the wing performing like we want it to perform. And it also generates proverse yaw. Uh, that is something that they found while they were working on the Prannel wing. A and currently, I have extended the elevons on my Mark II uh, to create that effect. And essentially what's happening is, is it moves the hinge line, that reverse taper moves the hinge line very close to the maximum thickness point of the airfoil. And the maximum thickness point is where the velocity is the greatest going over the top of the wing. So instead of putting turbulators here and trying to energize the flow, just move the hinge line up to where the velocity is already high. And then it has the energy in it to make it around the corner going down or back up. And for my ground test, it appears to work really well. Uh, we're about to find out with flight tests as soon as the weather comes around and I can get back out and do more flight testing. Um, so uh, I got my fingers crossed and it appears that that reverse taper elevon might be the optimal choice for just about any flying wing. And I think it would be fascinating. Uh, I wish I had one. If I had a Mitchell wing, I'd be cutting up the wing right now, I'd take the covering off of it, I'd cut it up and get rid of the anchor flaps on there and put on a reverse taper elevon and see what the thing flew like. It might be fantastic. Uh, you might be able to get rid of the winglets again uh, because if you get that proverse yaw set up just right, it, it could be peachy. Who knows? But we know overall that that was a very good design, flew well, many of them made, uh, very consistent over the years. Had a bit of a spin problem with it, but the reverse taper elevon should remove the spin issue and provide proverse yaw and give you the high control effectiveness you want at low speeds. So it could literally be a plus, plus, plus. Um, although it's one drawback, everything's a trade-off, a little harder to build. Uh, you'd have to go reinforce ribs and put a subspar in there and a bunch of other work. And that would add some weight to the aircraft. But if you do it carefully, it'll still be lightweight enough to pick it up and run with it. So if somebody's out there with a Mitchell wing or knows somebody that has one, shoot fire. Get out there, start cutting up that wing. <laughs> put a reverse. Just where, where the wing joint is, where the wing folds up, just make the Elevon have the minimum cord there possible to put a control horn on it and run it all the way up to the main spar at the tip so that the hinge point is as close to the main spar as possible and i think you'll have about the right shape and size for the elevon and it'd be fantastic to see how that flies of course it, it could ruin the whole thing and you might have a glider that's unflyable after that but you could always put it back the way it was before it's just a matter of labor and wood and glue and 
uh, if you didn't break a leg, you get to work on it right away. <laughs> but so I can't guarantee you to be work. It, it would work right out of the box. But I think something like that would be fascinating uh, to try and test. And I certainly would ground test it before I went and flew it. Anyway, and I, I realized looking at this, I missed one key note here. The other drawback to the Yonkers flap is um, that drag uh, that goes with the Yonkers flap, that's there all the time. Um, it's not just when you deflect it. You get even more drag when you deflect it, but it has more drag than a conventional setup at all flight speeds. So you really are paying a price uh, in three ways on added drag uh, to get that extra control effectiveness. And over the decades, we have found other ways to gain control effectiveness that aren't quite so draggy. So I encourage you to go look at my other videos that talk about reverse taper elevons and uh, keep sending questions in and suggestions on what my next design should be. Currently, what's coming in is people are looking for something that's lightweight and portable. And I say, geez, I, I thought we had that already called paragliders. I got one of those things. I fly paragliders. Uh, if you want lightweight and transportable, that's what you buy. Uh, but people still, there's some people out there that want a hang glider that's uh, a rigid wing that would be almost as portable as a paraglider and uh, lightweight. Uh, is that possible? I don't know. I've been thinking about it. I, I've just been thinking about why people would even want that. Uh, and I think that'll be the topic of the next video will be a discussion about what's happened to hang gliding over the decades. How come it's kind of petered out? There's much less of it going on now than there was years ago. And it is all because of the paragliders. It's something else. Uh, and I think it'll be an interesting topic for the next video. And I hope you come back to see that. And in the meantime, as I always say, fly safe and bye for now.